actually kind of excited about this talk because uh, I wanted to give people kind of an intuition. More of an. This is not going to be a super technical talk, but I wanted to give an intuition for how do you write functional programs that do sort of seemingly imperative things. Um, so you know things like reading from a database, writing to a database, uh, you know reading from files, drawing to screen. You know all these things that people think of as not necessarily being the best fit for functional programming. So. This is not going to be super technical. I'm not going to really talk directly about monads or iterates or anything. I, I want to just more show how you could actually kind of discover some of these concepts for yourselves if you just sort of start with the uh, sort of premise of functional programming and kind of work from there. So I'd like to make a, a bold claim here, which is that functional programming actually provides, I think, the most powerful tools for imperative programming um, out of any paradigm. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. But, but sort of the general idea is that when you're, when you're programming functionally, you're forced to move from directly performing the side effects yourselves to constructing uh, composable descriptions that, of programs that when you glue them together will result in some imperative program that does whatever it is you want it to do. And it's this moving from, you know, doing the actions yourselves to describing, uh, you know, basically a little language, a little imperative language, and assembling this little language. Um, that ends up being a very powerful approach. And uh, so I'm going to kind of, kind of demonstrate this with, you know, starting with a very simple example and and trying to build up a little bit. So. Um, this is, a, this is a very simple example. It's, it's a toy example. I'm just trying to give an intuition. Um, this example is actually uh, it was taken from the first chapter of Functional Programming in Scala, which uh, we just uh, released the MEEP today. And uh, you know, this is so. Let me just say a few things about this code. So we have a, play, a, a player case class, and um, we have this function declare winner which takes the player and, and you know, has the side effect of printing to console. Um, and then we have this uh, winner function here, which is, uh, you know, figuring out who the winner is and displaying it. Okay, so pretty simple block of code here, nothing too exciting. But so one of the things I want to point out is that whenever you have sort of imperative code like this where you're, there's some side effect occurring, in this case you're printing to the console, um, a lot of times there's a pure core sort of hidden inside, okay? Um, and in this case, if you look at this function winner, it's actually doing two different things. Uh, the first thing it's doing is there's logic for actually computing who the winner is. And then the second thing it's doing is it's having the side effect, oh, okay, now that it has the winner, I'm actually going to display it. And so we can factor this code a little bit differently to sort of reflect that intent. Um, so here I've just broken out the logic of computing the winner into a separate function. Um, and this is now a pure function. It's, just, it's still taking two players, but rather than having the side effect of, of printing to console, it's just returning the, the, the player that's the winner. Um, and then, you know, we can call that pure function, um, you know, and then still then pass it to, to the function that has the side effect. So this is kind of a very general thing that, that you can do, which is that really any time you have an, an impure function, um, you can generally factor it into, into sort of a pure core that's just a regular pure function and, and, and a sort of side effect that consumes the output and maybe does something with it, that's, you know, some action. Um, and you can do this sort of iteratively as well. So you don't have to just do this once. You can just kind of keep doing it. So um, like let's look at this function declare winner. Uh, you know, this is a function that has a side effect. It's printing to the console. But again, this is also doing two things because it's co both computing a message and then displaying that, that message. And we can go ahead and, and factor that out as well. Oh, so this is... Um, Sort of, you can formalize this idea a little bit of just, I have a pure function from, or an impure function from A to B, and 
I can sort of just factor that into a, a function from A to some description D and then a function or an interpreter of that description that takes the D to some type B. Um, and then in our case here we, I mean you can see how that applies in this case. Um, and, and the point is yeah, you can, you can keep doing this. So there's no, there's no sort of point at which you say, oh well I have an impure function so I can't sort of keep factoring it to sort of split apart its side effects. You can pretty much always do this. So here, um, yeah, I'm showing how you can separate the computing of the message that you want to render. You can separate that from actually displaying that message. And if you, I mean, I, I think of this as a very natural thing. You're, it's, they're really two separate concerns. Um, I mean, a lot of times we sort of intertwine these things in, in our code without really thinking about it. But if you're sort of looking for it, you can see, oh, I can sort of, sort of split apart those two concerns and, and have a nice composable sort of core. And then kind of on the outer edges of your program, that's where you have sort of your side effects where you actually are interacting with the real world. Okay, so if you sort of keep doing this, you, you eventually do get to sort of the outer edges of your program. So you've sort of factored all your, your side effects and you keep sort of pushing them to, to the outer layers. And eventually you get to a point where, okay, you actually do need to do something. You do need to have some effect on the world. You need to print to console. You need to read from a file, whatever it is. And so what do you do there? Well, do you just sort of give up and say, well, screw this functional programming. I'm just going to go back to imperative programming. Uh, well, no, okay, you don't. Um, so you can actually, you can actually continue this, this process. Um, but it, it maybe changes a little bit. So here what I've, what I've done is um, this function declare winner, which, you know, we were thinking of it before as something that necessarily requires some side effect because it actually needs to print the message. Uh, but what we can do is, instead I introduce this, this type, I call it action. It has this completely opaque um, uh, method run, which is really just interpret the action. And this function print line now, instead of actually, perf so this capital print line here, so instead of actually doing the side effect, it's just returning an action that when interpreted will produce the side effect, okay? So now you, you might be asking yourselves, well, has this really bought us anything, okay? And, uh, and, th and that's actually a really good question. So the thing, the thing I want to convey here is that when you, when you sort of go with this paradigm of your computing with these descriptions and you're composing these descriptions of things. So action is a description of what needs to happen. Um, there's sort of these, there's all these design choices of what, what makes a good, a good description. So um, action, you know, it's completely opaque, right? We can't sort of look at an action and, and really reason about what it's going to do. It's just really the only thing that it lets us do is delay when the when we sort of have to pay for the side effect. And so just like with any other data types that you're working with, we want to be, with, with these descriptions of sort of imperative programs, we want to be dealing with descriptions that are composable, that we can sort of combine in, in ways that are well defined and be able to reason about what they're going to do when we actually interpret them. Um, so we want to be able to sort of assemble these descriptions in well-defined ways, just, just like any other sort of library we might write. Um, and, the, you know, different design choices have different trade-offs. And you, the, the way to sort of approach these things is you look at your problem domain and you think of, well, what would be a good description for what I'm trying to do and what, what makes the things and programs I'm trying to express more natural. Um, so action, as I was saying, very opaque. Um, Really the only thing I can do with an action, it's only sort of APIs that I can combine two actions into one. Um, so, you know, I, I introduced this function plus plus, which is just going to run the first action. When it's interpreted, it's going to run the first action and run the second action. Um, so, but I don't know, th this isn't very interesting to me because um, I feel like 
I wouldn't really, if I just have a list of these actions, I mean, I, there's really nothing I can say about, I'm not going to know to run the third action and then the first action or, I mean, it's, it's just an opaque description. Um, I can't really combine it in any interesting way. Um, so another sort of uh, restriction with action is that uh, we can't handle what I, I would call input side effects. So here's sort of an example program I'd like to write. I'd like to be able to prompt the user to enter a temperature in Fahrenheit, and then I want to convert it to Celsius, and then print out the result. OK, just a very simple program. Now, um, you know, I, can, I have this, this function print line, which is returning an action, right? But there's no way to sort of encode an action that is a side effect that's going to return a result. So I don't really have any way that I can kind of chain an input uh, side effect, something that returns you know, a value, chain that to some further uh, you know, imperative program that I'm assembling. And so here, I'm just forced to actually call read line and actually do the side effect. And uh, you know, now this is no longer a pure function. It's, you know, this is just sort of a regular you know, imperative function here. So when you encounter situations like this, so as you sort of start to develop like a, a little API for assembling these, these little imperative programs, um, when you encounter a situation like this, you don't just throw up your hands and say, well, screw this functional programming stuff. I'm just going to do all this with unrestricted side effects. Well, no, you think about, well, I'm, I need to be able to ask my descriptions to express something additional, something that they can't currently do. And I'm going to sort of go back to my data type that I'm using for my descriptions and see what I could add to it to be able to support the use case that I'm trying to express. So um, here's sort of version two of, of action. So, so now actions, instead of just returning unit every time, um, actions, when they're interpreted, they're going to possibly perform some side effect, but they're also going to return a result um, of type A. And now that they actually return a result, now I can start to combine actions in more interesting ways. So um, I, d I defined, or you know, I sort of wrote out the signatures. You could define the, the methods map and flat map on action. And now that we have that, we can use action in four comprehensions. And we can write um, our example here of prompting the user for input. Um, so we call print line. Uh, then we call read line, and notice read line, it's an action string. So it's an, it's an imperative program that when run will produce a string. Um, so this is really just sort of gluing together the sort of bits of, of the imperative program so that um, I'm calling read line, I'm calling map, I'm converting the output of that sort of uh, imperative program, I'm converting that to a double, and then just sort of chaining that uh, you know, feeding that to, to, to the print line, converting to Celsius, et cetera. So, and if you look at this code, it's actually, it looks very much like the sort of original imperative program that we wrote. Um, I mean, it's, which is not, not really a coincidence here. Um, but this is not actually doing anything. This is not actually performing any side effects. This is just returning a pure description of what needs to happen. And it's only when I actually invoke run to interpret this, this description of this little language that I actually pay for those side effects. Um, so I, I think of this as a very natural thing. Like I, I just sort of set out to solve a problem. I noticed that, oh, I couldn't really do it with my sort of existing representation for actions. I thought about what I needed to add. And then I made that change. And, and now I'm still purely functional. And we can keep going. So um, I mean, one of the things you can do is you could just add more primitive actions here. So I, here I added uh, read lines and write lines. And you can kind of imagine how these would work. I haven't shown them here. But um, you know, read lines, it takes a file name. It's returning an action which, when interpreted, gives you the list of lines in the file. Um, write lines kind of works the same way, but it's dumping this list of strings to the file you give it. Um, and then here's a, you know, a, a program that reads a bunch of uh, 
you know, values from Fahrenheit.txt uh, into, you know, a list. So it's interpreting that program. So it's actually going to do that I.O. And then um, it, we're going to map over that, convert all those uh, temperatures to Celsius, and then write that to the output file. Okay? Very simple here. Um, and this is really not, any, I mean, this is kind of the same principles as, as the, the previous slide here. Now, so one of the problems with this representation of action um, is that, and, and by the way, the, this, the, what we have so far for action, it's, this is sometimes called the I.O. monad. It's a very simple version of the I.O. monad. And uh, kind of one of the problems with it is that we can't really, we can't really do things incrementally, which is, which is sort of what we would like to be able to do. I mean, what this is going to do, read lines, is it's going to take the entire contents of that file and read them into a list. Now, I mean, what if that file has, you know, a gajillion, a gajillion elements in it, and, and now we've re all read all that into memory, when really this, if you just sort of think of what this process is doing, it shouldn't need to, you know, keep everything in memory. It should be able to be streaming, uh, streaming in the, the temperatures from the input file, transforming them, and then dumping them to the output file, um, all in, in roughly constant memory. So, again, do we just throw up our hands and say, well, screw this functional programming? Uh, you know, let's, let's go back to imperative programming and, and open up some, some input streams and output streams and just do all this I.O. Ma manually? Well, no, we do, we do the same thing. So what are we really asking our, our, our descriptions to be able to do? Is we want to be able to kind of represent in a more abstract form a stream of, of values. And we, there are certain operations namely map, mapping over that stream that we want to be able to express. So let me kind of go over this. So you know, this is more just meant to be illustrative. I think if you actually sit down and try to think about how this stuff would work, you'll maybe come up with different ideas. But um, so here I have this, this data type source, and it has a function. It's a source of A, which conceptually you can think of it as like a stream of A's, OK? But it's not nailing down a particular representation of that stream. So the stream could be coming from a file, say. Um, and I've, I've said that there's this function map um, on a source, which lets me transform that stream. And you can notice the implementation is actually just, um, again, it's not doing anything. It's just purely returning a description that this mapping needs to occur. Um, so we have a case class map source, it takes the source, takes the function, and it's not doing anything with them. It's just saying, okay, this is here. This needs to happen. When you interpret this program, you're going to need to do this mapping. Um, and then we have a few other things. So file lines. You give it a file name, and it extends source string. And you can imagine the interpreter for um, this program. Well, here, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But so we have different, different sources. I can construct a source from just, if I happen to have a list of elements in memory, I can sort of promote that to a source. And then we have you know, a similar API as before, except lo let's look at read lines. So instead of read lines returning an action that returns a list of strings, the strict list, um, action is now just going to return um, it's, it's going to return just a source of strings, which is just, again, a description of a stream, basically, of, of, uh, of strings. And nothing's really going to happen with that description, um, you know, when, when you call read lines. And so here, again, I mean, and then we sort of glued together the logic in the same way. So this code actually looks pretty much identical to what we had before. Um, I mean, I actually think it, it is identical. Um, so the, the for comprehension is identical. We're still reading the lines, except lines, now it's not a strict list. It's actually just a description of a, a, stream, of, a stream that's coming from a file, really. Um, and then we map over that. 
and then we can write that to, um, you know, to the output file. Now, the interpreter for this little language, you know, it starts to get a little bit more complicated because the interpreter sort of needs to kind of keep track of these things. But, I mean, the interpreter can, can say, oh, you're, um, you're, you're reading from a file, you're mapping over it, and you're dumping it to another file. Well, okay, I can just, I'm just going to interpret that as you know, a very imperative loop of read, you know, some elements from the input, transform them, dump them, dump them to the output in just a streaming fashion. So as you sort of build up your descriptions to be what you want, your interpreter, you have to sort of add more smarts to your interpreter maybe. But, um, you know, the, the advantage is that you get to work with this really nice, um, this nice abstraction. And, uh, so I would just encourage you to, to actually try doing this for some imperative programs that you have. And in fact, so I'm, I'm not going to sort of give the answer, but so something to think about is, so we want to do this streaming, but what if we wanted to, um, you know, read, so read in these degrees Fahrenheit and then compute like a five element moving average, say, um, and then stream that to the output. So think about how you would do that um, you know, would we need to change our description at all to be able to handle that thing? Because right now all we can do is sort of map over a single value of, of a source. But to do this sort of moving average, we need to somehow have access to the history or allow the transformation of a source to retain some, some state or history as it's doing the transformation. Um, so, yeah. That's just something to think about. And, and those are the sorts of issues you'll encounter as you sort of build up these APIs is you'll just start to notice more and more, you know, little requirements like that. And, you know, it's like you don't have to be discouraged by them. It's just, oh, this is kind of a new requirement. And, and let me think about how I could maybe add that to my description and, and be able to, you know, still craft a nice, efficient interpreter for it. Um, so. Let me just give some examples of kind of this general paradigm. Uh, this is like s stuff that um, we've used at work. So we have like a library for uh, serializing, uh, serializing, you know, large structured Java objects uh, or Scala objects to, you know, nicely normalized database schemas. And, uh, you know, rather than having that library actually do the side effect of writing to the database, it instead just returns a description of what needs to happen, which takes the form of essentially a stream of tuples sent to different tables. Um, a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. And then, so the library just produces sort of that stream of tuples, and then we can compose the, you know, that, those programs in different ways, and then there's a completely separate thing which interprets that description and actually writes all the stuff out to the database. Um, another example is like, um, you know, we have sort of this custom way that, you know, users can lay out uh, a bunch of data into, into a report. And, you know, rather than having the layout actually do the side effect of, of rendering the GUI, we separated sort of the description of the, of the layout of what they're trying to render. We separate that from actually rendering the layout to, a, to an actual GUI. Um, and there's, there's, if you just sort of look at things with this lens, there's just tons of ex examples of it, of like decouple the description or the, little, or the language from the interpreter, and oftentimes the, the language ends up being something that's very nicely composable and, and easy to work with. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the takeaway is start, if you have imperative programs, start by sort of factoring out the effects, kind of move them to the outer layers of your, of your program. And then once you get to that point, try to come up with nice composable descriptions uh, that you can assemble to, to create interesting programs that, that do what you want them to do. Um, so I'm hoping this kind of gave people sort of an intuition for it. Um, so uh, I'm working on this book, uh, Functional Programming in Scala, with uh, Brunar Bjarnason and Tony Morris. Uh, it's coming out hopefully later this year, and uh, it's, it's going to be talking a lot about these. I mean, we, we just released the, the Manning Early Access Program. Um, there's a few chapters up there, and um, yeah, the, the book is, talks about these issues in a lot more detail, and 
there's a lot, I mean, this is sort of a, oh, you could have discovered these things yourself. Um, but, you know, if you sort of work through the book, we sort of go into, oh, what are the idioms that people have discovered? What are the nice abstractions that people have, have found for assembling these, these descriptions and, and writing useful uh, imperative programs functionally? So, yeah, that's, that's all I got. So anyone have any questions? Yes, go ahead. So if you factor your side effects out to the outer layer, everything else is pure. What's so bad about having your DAO just right to the database when everything else is pure, testable, composable? Yeah, uh, nothing. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, and in fact, it's, at some level, there, there needs to be something that's actually having the side effect kind of Sometimes we say it's at the end of the universe. Um, so it's not really a side effect if, if no one's around to observe it. Um, what makes it a side effect is that it breaks uh, referential transparency. But if, if there's no sort of enclosing program to see that the side effect has occurred, then it doesn't actually break referential transparency. And f as far as your program is concerned, you, you might as well have not have executed that side effect and it was just the program that called your, your program that actually performed that side effect. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you ultimately, at the end of the universe, you do have that. Yes. Right, yeah, so the question is, is, is it fair to say that the approach is basically you're returning an imperative program that is then executed? And yeah, that is what you're doing. Um, the power of the approach is that you're not limited to sort of the imperative language that you're given, you know, like, it doesn't have to be like C. I mean, you can sort of design whatever sort of nice composable little language you want for, for doing this sort of thing and then pro sort of program to that as your API. And that, that's kind of what makes it so powerful as opposed to just doing the imperative programming directly where you're sort of forced to do things the way the machine wants you to do them. Um, yes. Okay, the question is, how many times have I forgotten to call unsafe perform IO at the end of the universe? Uh, because the program will compile just the same either way. Yeah, I, I guess not. Never. I don't know. It's not really a problem in practice. I mean, in practice, like we have we have a ton of code, and we're not we're not completely pure all in all of our code. So, I mean, you can think of this as a, just an approach for really controlling where your effects occur. So we'll we'll sort of you know have a pure core, and then we'll call unsafe perform IO you know, it's not necessarily at the outermost layer of our program, but that's okay. I mean, we've, we can't sort of rewrite our entire architecture to be pure. I mean, maybe if we were starting from scratch, we would, but, you know, it's okay to just sort of push things out as far as you want and then call and say perform IO there. Um, and that can be sort of the end of your universe. And you still have all that composability within that little universe you've carved out for yourself, so. Thank you, everyone.